We talked about foreshadowing in literature last week, and we have an amazing example. In Genesis chapter 22, God asked Abraham to do the unthinkable, to offer his own son Isaac as a sacrifice to God. Abraham had been praying, he'd been waiting. God said, I'm going to give you his son. Abraham tried to do everything on his own, and God said, here is your son, but give me your son, your only son, this promised one. I want you to give him to me as an offering. And Hebrews 11, 17 to 19 says, By faith, Abraham, was, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering, offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. God asked Abraham to offer his only son as a sacrifice. And Hebrews lets us know the details of it. God was testing his faith. He wanted to see if Abraham really believed in this God, really believed that God not only could give him his son back from the dead, but that God gives and God takes, and it's all in God's hands. Are we willing to truly trust him? If you remember your Sunday school stories as a kid, you can picture Abraham with the knife in the air, and an angel swoops in and stops his hand and says, Abraham, don't do this. I've got it covered. And they look over and they see a ram in the thicket. There's the sacrificial animal that God had planned for the whole event. And a thicket is a thorny, thick brush. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb, wearing the crown of thorns into his head, just like that ram caught by its head in the thicket. The Son of God was the substitutionary sacrifice who eventually paid the price for the sins of the whole world with his blood, with his death on the cross. And in that instance, God didn't stop it and say, I know you're willing to do this, son, but I'm not going to let you go through with it. Jesus said, Lord, I'm willing, even if this is the only way, I'm willing to follow your will. No other sacrifice would do. Nothing else could possibly satisfy God's wrath and judgment on the world's sin. All of the sheep, all of the goats in the world couldn't have paid for your sins and mine. It was only the sacrifice of the Son of God. And that's where we come to in our series. We're near the end of the Gospel of Mark, the crown and the cross. And Mark has shown us as Jesus as a man with a clear mission. He's the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man. He was 100% human, but at the same time, 100% God. The reader is called actively into the story, and in every narrative, the question is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to believe him, or are you going to deny him? His life on earth helped us better understand who God is, because we saw Jesus, the Son of God, living his life out in front of us. We saw the way he responded to everyday problems, the way he responded to ridicule, the way he responded to people in need. He showed us God's character and what his kingdom was like. And the first half of the book was focusing on him as the Messiah, and then the second half has been Jesus in Jerusalem walking, moving towards the cross. That's the focal point where he's going to die, and then he said, I will rise again in three days. We saw last week's sermon, Jesus was crucified. He was nailed to a cross and put between two common criminals. The people mocked him. They made fun of him. The promised Messiah nailed to a tree. But God had a plan for it all. Today, as we continue his time on the cross, we're going to see that this scene is dramatically cloaked in absolute darkness, as the gospel is clearly proclaimed, not by the leaders of Israel, but by one of his executioners. Again, God is presenting this as the most incredible drama 
of all time. Not only because it's true, because it's all things that we would never expect. They didn't think their hero was really going to die. They didn't think that he would be rejected and mocked. And they wouldn't think that a Roman soldier would be the one to get it and say, this is the Son of God. We're in Mark chapter 15. If you want to turn there in your Bible, there are pew Bibles in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible at home, you are welcome to take that home with you. So you have it to read. Matthew 27, Luke 23, John 19 are all parallel passages in those other Gospels. And if you look in your bulletin, you'll find a note sheet. If you like taking notes, you can follow along. If you're here with us online, welcome. You can go to faithlife.com slash Dunkirk Baptist, and you can find the notes there digitally. Before we read God's Word this morning, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us together on this chilly winter morning. Thank you that we're here without any snow or bad weather, that you, there's nothing keeping us from coming together to worship you, to lift up the name of Jesus, to declare together that you are the Son of God, and to understand better the power of the cross. Lord, I pray that as we read your Gospel of Mark today, that our hearts would be prepared to hear the truth, that you'd reveal to us what's going on in our own hearts. Help us to see how we need to respond to today's message, whether it's receiving the Gospel for the first time or being ready to proclaim it and share it with others. Lord, I just thank you and praise you and ask that everything that we say and do would bring honor and glory to your Son, Jesus. It's in his name I pray, amen. So Mark 15, verses 33 down to 47, end of the chapter. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joses, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Jesus had been hanging on the cross for three hours. It's now noon, and complete darkness covers the land for the next three hours. We know that this darkness has to be supernatural. It's the middle of the day in the Middle East. The sun would normally be directly overhead. It's not nighttime. The Passover occurs during the full moon, so it can't be a coincidence of a solar eclipse. Solar eclipses only last for eight minutes in their total dark period. 
So all of the natural reactions to this that people said, oh, it just was this or it was just that, none of those are possible. God brought darkness over the world as a symbol of his judgment on sin. Back in Amos chapter 8, verses 9 and 10, it says, And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will make it like the morning for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. And the morning in that verse was M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. The morning, the very creation was mourning its creator's death. The earth was dark and you couldn't see anything. Here's more foreshadowing from the book of Exodus in chapter 10, the ninth judgment of Egypt. If you remember, Moses kept saying, let my people go, and he brought judgment after judgment after judgment. The ninth judgment was complete darkness. And not coincidentally, it lasted for three days. Here we have three hours. This is God foreshadowing and showing us what this judgment looks like. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. Have you experienced that kind of darkness? where you feel it, you feel complete desolation, you feel forsaken, you can't see anything, you can't see anyone, there's all complete darkness. This is a symbol of judgment. And that was coming before the final judgment, the death of the firstborn. Three days of judgment before the firstborn would be executed throughout all the land of Egypt. That was the final judgment before freedom could occur for the, land of, for the people of Israel. Here at Calvary, we have darkness for three hours. It's getting everyone's attention. Something big is about to happen. The sacrificial death of God's beloved son, the firstborn giving his life for the sins of the whole world. God gave them that image as they thought about Passover, and here it is again, Passover weekend, and they have utter darkness. And after three hours of nothing happening, just pitch black, Jesus speaks. Each gospel presents the crucifixion in a different way. Matthew is speaking to Jews, so he doesn't explain the things that the Jews would normally know. Mark is writing to Romans, to Gentiles, and so he explains some things in a different way so that they would understand it. But Mark also gives us a really stark, no-frills version of this event doesn't mean that they're not all true. It just means he wants us to really focus on the darkness, the silence, the agonizing suffering, the separation of the Son of God. No one could see him and this idea that even the Father wasn't looking at his Son. No further words from Jesus are even mentioned in this gospel other than, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Matthew, Luke, and John all give us additional words from Jesus, but Mark wants us to focus on this time of being forsaken. If you were here with us last week, you'll recall that this was an excruciating, slow, painful death. This wasn't standing before a firing squad and it's over. This was slow and painful. Each breath was difficult and the person hanging on the cross, as we talked about last week, had to struggle for every breath to stay alive. But after all of these hours, Jesus says, speaks loudly in a loud voice, clearly for all to hear. He's not groaning. He's not whispering. He's in full voice because 
He's in full control. He's saying what he needs to say, what he wants people to hear. And Jesus' words are recorded here in Aramaic. That was a language that most of the people in the area spoke. And then Mark also gives it to us in Greek for his readers to understand. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 that Haley just read for us earlier. If you were in Psalm 22 as she read that, if you were following along, you can put a little cross next to that because that's a messianic psalm. Next time you'll read it, you'll see it and say, oh, this is talking about the Messiah. There's no one else that it could be referring to. It's not talking about David. It's talking about the future Messiah. Psalm 8, Psalm 20, Psalm 41, Psalm 45, Psalm 69, 72, 110, 118, all of these are messianic psalms and there are many more where the writer, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was writing about the Messiah to come. In the darkness, hanging on the cross, the weight of the world's sin on his shoulders, Jesus feels forsaken by God. And that's the story of so many of the Psalms. God, how could you let the wicked prosper? God, how could you leave me alone when I need you? God, where are you? But, God, you are good. God, you are strong. You are powerful. You know me. You love me. You care for me. You hear me. That's how the Psalms turn. And if you read them, you'll see that in every one of them, where they start out with this cry of anguish. But then the writer says, but God, you know me. You love me. You wouldn't leave me alone. You will judge the wicked. Your righteousness will follow through. So that even while Jesus feels forsaken by the cross, he knows the rest of the psalm. He knows that God hears him and sees him. And God will not leave him alone. Mark doesn't explain all that to us. He just leaves us hanging with this idea, did God really forsake his own son? Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, other places in the New Testament tell us a little bit more. Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He had to take on our sin so that he could die for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus led a perfect, sinless life. He didn't sin a single time. He was tempted in every way as we were. He suffered. He felt hunger. He felt pain. He felt mocking and rejection. He experienced all of those things. But his response was always one that glorified his Father. He never sinned. He alone could carry the sins of the world on his shoulders and die for us. Habakkuk 1.13 says, speaking of God, you who are of pure eyes than to see evil cannot look at wrong. Why do you so idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Again, in silence, the traitors are hanging there next to Jesus and the righteous one Carrying the sin of the world. God can't look at his sin. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's the description of our God. He is holy. He is holy. He is holy. Sin can't be in his presence. That's why our relationship with him is broken. Because we're born in sin. And everyone that is honest would say through our lives, we continue to sin. We choose What is wrong? We choose what we want instead of what God wants. 
And God says, your sin can't be in my presence. I can't have a relationship with you with all of that sin in you. So the Son of God said, I will take it. I'll bear the cost. I'll die in your place. So that in Him, His righteousness wipes away our sin. And God looks at us and says, you are my daughter. You are my son. The blood of Jesus Christ granted us righteousness. Jesus wasn't just quoting the beginning. As I said, he knew the rest. Verse 24, past where Haley read, says, God, you have not hidden your face from me. When I cried out, you heard me. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations of the world shall worship before you. The name of Jesus will be proclaimed throughout the ends of the world. All of the nations, including the Gentiles, will worship our God because Jesus, the Son of God, was willing to die in your place and mine. Verse 28 says, Kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. It's talking about future prophecy yet to come when Jesus will stand on earth with an earthly kingdom. Even in this moment of complete darkness, as a man feeling forsaken, not only by his disciples, his family, his friends, being mocked by everyone, Jesus knows that victory is coming. His hope is in the Lord. And he submitted himself to the agony of the cross because he will be saved. He will rise again and he will save us. The people standing around hear Jesus say, Eloi. And they mock him, saying, maybe he's calling Elijah, which in their language would have been Elias, close to Eloi. Maybe Elijah's going to come save him. And someone puts sour wine, which is like our wine vinegar, on a sponge and they hold it up to him. One of the other gospels says that he took some of it for his parched mouth. He wasn't drinking wine like we saw in the previous passage because he said, I'm not going to drink wine again until I'm in the kingdom. But this vinegar was used for quenching people's thirst. How many of you like to drink wine vinegar when you're thirsty? We don't do it today, but that was part of their culture. They would have a jug of it. The soldiers would drink it when they just needed a little bit of liquid. Even this minor occurrence was prophesied hundreds of years earlier in Psalm 69, 21. For my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Even that little piece is there prophesied hundreds of years ahead of time. Jesus hung, forsaken, feeling forsaken, but knowing what was coming. Jesus shouted again in verse 37 with a loud voice, and he breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Jesus was on the cross for six hours. It tells us in the previous passage that it was 9 a.m. when they nailed him to the cross. It was noon when darkness came, and now it's 3 p.m. He's hung there for three hours in darkness he shouted again loudly. The other Gospels tell us that he spoke words. He says, it is finished. It is finished. I've done everything I came to accomplish. I've completed my mission. And Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus was on the cross for six hours, and it wasn't until the darkness was completed. It wasn't until he was ready that instead of just fading away, as we talk about, talked about before, when you're on a cross, you died of asphyxiation. You just finally couldn't get another breath and you passed out from that. But this isn't how Jesus died. He died in full command, in full voice. Regular men didn't die like that on the cross. It often took several days for them to slowly, agonizingly die. Jesus didn't go out with a faint whisper, but with a roar, the Lion of Judah, heard by all.
Jesus trusted and obeyed his Father. And when he said, it is finished, he bowed his head and he died. He was in complete control. And he trusted his Father to the very end. Into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm coming home, Father. Mark doesn't record those words. Instead, he lets a Roman officer, the head of the execution squad, do the talking for us. It says he stood face to face with Jesus. And after seeing by which way he breathed his last and how he died, he said, truly, this is the Son of God. This is not a mere man. Brings us back all the way to the beginning of Mark's Gospel. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Mark. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And here we have at the end, the declaration, truly, this is the Son of God. The Roman centurion had a title. Someone can correct me later. I don't know if he was an officer or if he was like a sergeant, an enlisted officer, but he had rule over a hundred men. And in this case, he was the one in charge of the execution squad. He wanted to make, he was there to make sure that the victim was properly executed. That they followed all of the rules. That he was nailed to the cross. That everyone could see him. And he had to make sure that he died. That was his job, to execute this person. And verse 39 says, When he saw the way that he died, the way he breathed his last, he said, this man was the Son of God. The centurion was the only one to honestly declare who Jesus was. Remember the religious leaders mocked him and said, King of Israel, come down if you really are. The others looked at him and again mocked him. And here is a Roman, a Gentile. He had probably seen hundreds of people die. But this one was different. This was not an ordinary man. The sky turned black. The other Gospels tells us that there was a violent earthquake. The dead rose from their tombs. The centurion couldn't see that happening, but he could feel the earthquake. He experienced darkness for three hours. And Mark says, because of the way Jesus died, this hardened soldier recognized the one true God in human flesh. He wasn't a religious leader of Israel, one who had studied and waited for the Messiah to come. He wasn't a Jewish man who longed for redemption, for the Redeemer to come. He was a Gentile who came face to face with Jesus, and it changed his life forever. He accepted the truth, and he proclaimed it immediately for all to hear. Truly, this was the Son of God. That's the kind of title that they used for Caesar. The head of Rome was called a son of God. They believed that he was ruling in the God's place here on earth. But he says, here is the son of God. Verse 38 tells us that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Exodus 26, you can just write this down. Verses 31 and 32 says, you'll make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns. There will be cherubim skillfully worked into it, and you'll hang it on four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, on hooks of gold, on bases of silver. This was a substantial, thick, and heavy curtain. Approximately 60 feet tall by 30 feet wide. Possibly as much as a thousand pounds. Half a ton. This didn't just tear because it was old. In our church in Indiana, we had a new building built, and behind the uh, platform of the church was a big black curtain that was hung so that we could light it and we could 
make it look different, kind of like the way we use our lights up here. But this big curtain was hung, and they said, oh yeah, we'll have to make sure we put in adequate supports for this curtain. Those of you that have hung curtains at home, you might put in a wall anchor, but this was steel beams and all kinds of weights because it was heavy. It was bigger than the temple curtain, and it needed to support thousands of pounds. Even the earthquake couldn't have ripped this curtain. It might have tore an edge of it if something had happened, but it said from top to bottom. It wasn't people grabbing it at the bottom and tearing at the curtain because they were mad. It was God himself ripping it from the top to the bottom. This curtain was the separation for the Holy of Holies. The Shekinah glory of God rested in the Holy of Holies. That was God's presence among his people. And only on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, the holiest man, the high priest, could enter to this place. And it was only after he was washed and cleaned and had perfectly spotless white linen from head to toe, and he had to offer blood offerings so that all of his sin had been taken care of before he went into this holy of holies. The ripping of this curtain from top to bottom is signifying God opening up access to him. The atoning sacrifice of Jesus ripped this curtain wide open, ending the sacrificial system. No longer would the blood of goats and sheep cover the people's sins, but the very Son of God would give up his life so that we could enter into God's presence. No longer through a man, a priest representing us, but through Jesus himself, our great high priest, we can pray directly to God. This is something that the Jews just struggled to understand and appreciate, that they could just go pray at any time. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we think nothing of talking to God. Sometimes we do it in a very flippant way, but we have direct access at any moment of any time of our day. We can bow our heads and say, God, help me. I need you. He wants to hear from you. And in a symbol, he ripped open that curtain. Hebrews 10, 12 to 14 said, Christ, when he offered a single sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Verses 40 to 41 tell us about the women who are witnesses at the cross. None of the disciples are named, none of the men who followed with him, but Mark points out that women were watching from a distance. And he tells us about three specific women. If you remember from this past series, very few times does Mark give us details of people's names. He tells us names when it's important. To the initial readers in Rome, they probably knew these women, but he wants us to recognize that it was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph and Salome. These women were eyewitnesses to the crucifixion. They saw Jesus die, and they would see his burial and his resurrection. Mark wants the readers to know that they saw the whole thing. So he interjects them here where it just seems like an odd place. Oh, and by the way, there were some women watching. There's no confusion about his death. There's no confusion about his burial location, and there could be no confusion about the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene had been possessed by seven demons, and she met Jesus face to face, and he set her free. And she followed him for the rest of his time on earth. Mary, the mother of James the Younger and Joseph, is again probably a woman that the Roman church would have known. Her son James and Joseph were followers of Jesus. And Salome is described in Matthew's gospel as the mother of of the sons of Zebedee, James and John. The passage says that these women had followed Jesus, ministering to him throughout 
his time on earth. They were part of his group of disciples. We always think of the 12 men, but there were these women who were also following along, serving Jesus as he ministered to others. They followed him right to Jerusalem and to the very end. None, again, of the men are mentioned, but the women are mentioned. Don't miss that important detail because women in the Middle East at the time of Mark's gospel, women were not acceptable witnesses in legal proceedings. If you were going to court and a woman had seen something happen, you couldn't bring them in to testify in court. Only men could testify. But God chose a Gentile centurion, and he chose women to proclaim the news of salvation through Jesus Christ. God has many places for women in ministry. We see that throughout the rest of the New Testament. Women who helped Paul through his ministry, through the other disciples. Women who offered up their homes, offered hospitality. So many different places. And there is a place for you today in ministry as well. I hope the women in our church never feel like second-class citizens because God has given us all places to serve The chapter ends with his burial, and there's a lot of explanation of that. After a slow death, the bodies of the crucified men were often left on the cross to decompose for the ravens and the wild dogs to come and rip at what was left of their bodies. Because again, this was a public statement, don't go against Rome. You don't want to be this guy. So those bodies were left often for a long time as that deterrent. And then eventually, the Romans would collect the bones and just throw them into a mass grave. But it's Friday afternoon. The Passover is about to begin at 6 p.m. And this isn't any Passover, it's, I'm sorry, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Sabbath, thank you. The Sabbath is about to happen. It's the Passover Sabbath. And the day of preparation is getting ready for the Sabbath because you weren't allowed to do work on the Sabbath. That was the time to gather your food, gather everything you needed so you were ready to worship and focus on God. Jesus died at 3 p.m. And there's just a few hours before Sabbath begins. In order to fulfill God's law, Any burial had to be completed before sunset in order to not profane the Sabbath and also to comply with the law of Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 to 23. You can jot that down. Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23. It says, If a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, do not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day. You must not desecrate the land. Shockingly, who buries Jesus? Not his disciples, not his followers, not even his family members, but two members of the Sanhedrin, the council of religious leaders, the ones who wanted to see Jesus die. They wanted to get rid of him. Joseph from Arimathea, a suburb of Jerusalem, was known as a respected and wealthy member of the council. But it says he was secretly looking for the kingdom of God. Luke 23 says he was a follower of Jesus. He had not consented to their decision to have him executed and crucified. Matthew 27 says Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. So Joseph gets up his courage and goes to Pilate and says, may I have the body of Jesus so that I can bury him properly according to our laws and our customs. Don't leave him hanging there before the Sabbath. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was already dead. He's expecting it to be several days And so he says to the centurion, go make sure that this guy's really dead, that they're not trying to pull a fast one and just sneak him away and resuscitate him. Make sure he's really dead. 
So the centurion is sent to confirm that Jesus was really dead. And verse 45, instead of saying body, it says, he granted the corpse to Joseph. The corpse. Jesus died. He didn't swoon. He didn't faint. He didn't go into a temporary coma and then wake up three days later. He was dead. And the other Gospels give us the detail that as they went by, they broke the bones of the two thieves so that they could no longer lift up and get a breath. They were speeding along the process. And it said, when they saw that Jesus was already dead, they thrust a spear into his side. He didn't move. And blood came out, separated blood and plasma. They knew he was dead. You can have his corpse. Joseph purchased a linen burial shroud. And in John 19, it tells us that Nicodemus, also a secret follower of Jesus, part of the Sanhedrin, brought aromatic myrrh and aloe. And as we said last week, that myrrh was there at his birth. Myrrh, frankincense, and gold. And now here's myrrh being part of his burial. They wrapped myrrh and other spices to hide the smell of the body as they buried it. It wasn't a, an Egyptian entombment, like making a mummy, but it just made the body smell a little better. These two men who were afraid to stand up for Jesus, we have no record of them fighting with the other Sanhedrin members. They stayed quiet, but now they're willing to publicly say, we want to bury Jesus. And it says they laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock, and they rolled a large stone in front of the entrance. And other Gospels tell us that the Romans put a banners across it and sealed it with wax so that no one could open it. Matthew's Gospel tells us that this was a new tomb. It had never been had a body in it. And again, that sounds weird to us because we bury people in the ground, right? They go into a casket and that goes in the ground and we never see it again. But this is an above ground cave that they've carved out of a rock and into the wall they would carve flat tables where they could lay a body. And once the body had fully decomposed, they would gather the bones, put them into a little jar and then they would put another family member in there. They were at, at times going in and out of this tomb. It was large enough for other bodies, but Joseph was wealthy enough to have this purchased just outside of Jerusalem, and another prophecy from Isaiah is fulfilled. Isaiah 53, 9, they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. A rich man provided the tomb. Verse 47 tells us that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. They saw him die on the cross. They followed them. Joseph and Nicodemus, they followed him into the garden. They saw the tomb where he was laid. So that later, when they go back looking for him, no one could say, oh, maybe they just had the wrong place. Maybe they were in the wrong part of the cemetery. They saw exactly where Jesus was laid. All of these details are so that the reader could understand that he really died. He was really buried. And later, he really did come back from the dead. And praise the Lord for that. That's our salvation. The core of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15.4, we sang about it this morning so beautifully, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15.4 Later in the second century, there were Gnostic groups who tried to claim that Jesus had only fainted and that he didn't really die because if he was God, he couldn't die. Others said that he switched places with Simon, the Cyrene. And as he was carrying the cross, they crucified the wrong man. Here are the women who followed him for three years. Here are 
leaders of the Sanhedrin who knew Jesus. They didn't bury the wrong man. It was the right one. All of those were laid out. The centurion watched him face to face. He made sure he really died. He saw them take him down from the cross and carry him to the tomb. Even today, there are people who want to say, Jesus was a good man. He had such great teaching. Love each other. Just be kind to each other. But he didn't really die. He's not really the Son of God. He was just a good man. They don't want to accept that the Son of God would die for their sins. People don't want to accept that they have sins to die for in the first place. But coming face to face with the Son of God and recognizing that He died for you and that He rose again to offer you eternal life, that makes all the difference. So our takeaways this morning... Do you know what it feels like to be forsaken? Do you feel like you're in total darkness? Maybe you feel that today. Lost, forgotten by people, your family, your friends. You feel like nobody knows you, nobody cares. You're suffering inside and there's no one you can tell. There's no one that would listen to you. God, how could you forsake me? Maybe you've cried that out without thinking but he hears my prayer and he will rescue me. Jesus knows exactly how that feels. He was forsaken because he carried my sins on the cross. He carried your sins on the cross. He was forsaken as the Father looked away from him, not being able to see the weight of his sin on his shoulders. And he died when he was ready. He wasn't a victim. His blood paid the debt for you and I so that we could have our sins forgiven so that a perfect, holy, holy, holy God could look at you and say, daughter, son, come home. You're ready to be with me for eternity because your sins have been covered by my son's righteousness. He paid for you to have entrance into heaven. Do you believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God? If you do, then the response is, repent of your sins. Tell God, yes, I am a sinner, and yes, I need Jesus. I need His forgiveness, and I need life in Him. Believing that He died and that He rose again to eternal life. If you've never done that, let today be the day that you would say, Yes, I've come face to face with Jesus. I know and I understand who he is, and I want him to be my Lord and Savior. If you're watching online, you can contact me through the church office. If you're here, you can talk to me after the service. At the end of the movie Saving Private Ryan, James Ryan is an old man, and he's visiting the cemeteries in Normandy and watching his family explore and see cross after cross after cross of men who gave their lives in the fight for freedom. And as he's thinking about all of those men, in addition to the ones who very individually gave their lives for his freedom to keep him alive, he looks to his wife and he says, did I live a good life Tell me I was a good man. He wants to know whether his life lived up to their sacrifice. Did he honor them by living a way that made the most of his life when those men willingly gave theirs for him? If you've already trusted Jesus as your Savior, if you know that he's the one that saved you, are you living like you've been saved? Do you wake up each morning and say, I've got another day because of Jesus. I have eternal life because of Jesus. How could I treat my salvation so poorly as to not care about it? How could I not jump into his word and want to know him and love him more? How could I not look at the people around me and say, I have to share this gift of life with them. 
He loved me. How can I not love you? Are you living a good life? Not good life so that God will accept you, but are you living a life that measures up to what Jesus did for you? We can never do as much as he did, but are you willing to sacrifice your time? Are you willing to sacrifice your comfort? Are you willing to give things up so that others can hear the good news and know your Savior? Philippians 1, 27 to 28 says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened by anything in your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but it's a sign of your salvation, and that is from God. Brothers and sisters, I would encourage you to make a fresh commitment to serving our Savior, to honoring His sacrifice on the cross, and to bringing Him all the glory in everything you say and do. Truly, He is the Son of God. Mark's going to come as we close in a final song. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for sacrificing your own son, God himself dying on a cross, carrying the weight of the sin of the world so that we could have a relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for obeying the will of your Father, being willing to sacrifice, being willing to feel that forsakenness as you carried our sin and died for it. Thank you that we can have salvation in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And in that salvation, we have a restored relationship with God our Father. We can have communion with you. We can have brothers and sisters in Christ who encourage us. And we have the gift of eternal life because Jesus overcame death, overcame the power of sin so that we could live free to you. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.